Um, so this is um, another Open Atom talk. I'll be continuing to talk about the Open Atom. And um, but this talk is about the GW method implementation for electronic excitation. And my name is Min Jung Kim from Yale University. And this is our wonderful team to work on Open Atom GW, funded by NSF. So she introduced the density functional theory. So I'm just going to. Um, briefly explain again. Um, so the density functional theory is the theory that tells you how the electron interacts in many body systems. And the energy is written as a, den a dense electron density, which is an R. And um, this, the energy can be um, minimized over um, the density and R. And when we minimize the, this energy functional, then we can get the ground state energy and the ground state density. So the minimum condition for this energy functional turns out to be the equivalent to Kuhn-Sham equation, which is the eigenvalue uh, equation. Um, so this is the kinetic energy term, and this is the ion interaction, and this is Hartree, which is the electron electron um, repulsion. But this one is the exchange correlation term, which includes the, some kind of quantum effect. And this term can be determined exactly, but this exchange correlation um, is hard to know exact. So some people have come up with some idea of approximate this exchange correlation. Um, so LDA and GGA, um, which local density approximation and generalized gradient approximation has been used and it gives you good geometries and total energies. So the density functional theory is um, the most widely used method in computational physics and chemistry. However, it doesn't give us all the good things. It, uh, it predicts a bad band gap and excitations. So for example, when it comes a problem of DFT, is, um, the energy gap is in the electron volt. Um, this one is local density approximation, and this is the experiment. And as you can see, um, it's not the same. Um, it has like one electron volt or two electron volt difference. So is it really matter? The answer is yes, in some, some case. So if you want to design the new material, for like photovoltaic cells, then it's important to use those uh, many photons from the solar spectrum here. Uh, this is the optical absorption of um, silicon crystal. And as you can see, this LDA predicts um, it observed the photons around like two-ish electron volt. But the experiment tells us that actually it happens from like three electron volt. And as you can see in the solar spectrum, if it's off more than one, one electron volt, we, then we will um, you get uh, not reliable uh, materials prediction. So there was a one problem. And the other problem is of DFT is the band energy alignment. Um, so for example, the electrons can transfer um, an interface. This is the polymer and this is the nanowire. And we want to excite the electron in polymer and want uh, to move this electron to this nanowire. So we need to know the energy level. So uh, the electron goes from high energy to the lower energy. Um, but DFT has uh, errors in band energy. So e even though we predict um, the band energy and Maybe we say that, OK, electron can transfer from here to there. We are not sure, we're not sure 100% if this is going to really happen when we actually make the materials. So we go back to um, the original problem and um, think what we want to get. And so this is the electron comes to the one system at time 0 at r prime position. Then what we want to know is if it what, where is this electron at time t? So we want to know about the propagation. And this is another propagation here of um, momentum space. So this is g. This g is called Green's function, which encoded all uh, of the propagation of the electrons. So um, what we want to um, solve is this Dyson equation. 
Um, these three terms are pretty similar with the DFT, uh, but difference is this exchange correlation term. Um, this one is a self, and this is called a self energy. But the self energy, um, similar like exchange correlation functional, um, it's hard to know. So we need a good approximation, and people has been using GW approximation, which has given us a pretty good uh, result. So, oops. Yeah, so here I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the success of the Green's function. So I tabulated this LDA and experiment in previous slide, and now added this GW. So as you can see here, this GW improves a lot uh, in terms of the particle gaps, uh, which is good. And the GW method can be used to uh, some materials like. Uh, like copper, which is not an insulator, but um, these dots are from experiment and um, these lines from GW calculation, so you can even uh, apply this method to metals as well. Then, okay, GW is good, then what is the big system that we can run with using GW, uh, GW software? So this is the, one of the system that we interest we are interested and this is a polymer and nanowire I mean we want to see of the band alignment uh, typical size of the cell includes like a uh, few hundreds of atoms but it's not possible to run this kind of GW calculation routinely with current software because it's too big um, it takes a lot of computer time so I'll explain you why GW is expensive. So DFT is theoretically cubic scaling, but GW is uh, into the fourth, and BSC, which gives optical excitation, is into the sixth method. But the actual, in the actual system, the real killer is the GW. Um, so we would like to tackle this problem uh, of GW calculation. And first, then once we are satisfied with GW, we'll move to BSC later. But um, here we are focusing on GW calculations. So this is the typical step for um, GW calculations. So first step is run uh, DFT calculation and get uh, the energy and the wave function. And we calculate the polarizability matrix, uh, which is how the electrons talk to each other. And then we do the double FFT rows and columns, so we get uh, polarizability in G, G prime, uh, G space. Then we compute the dielectric matrix, then do the inversion. So this um, P, E, epsilon is a very big uh, matrix, so the inversion um, is also um, involves a big matrix. Then at stage four, we do um, the plasmon pole method and calculate the dynamic um, Electric, dielectric matrix, and we put together all, all these numbers and get the self energy. So this is the uh, steps. Then uh, where the GW calculation takes more time and energy is um, the polarizability. This one is the response function, uh, how the electron density changes at R when we change the potential at R prime. So this is the explicit ex um, e equation from standard perturbation theory. Uh, as you can see, um, this V means um, occupied states, and C means um, uh, unoccupied state, which is empty here. So because of this double sum, it scales and, uh, into the fourth, and we have to um, generate all the empty states, which usually um, a lot. And we have to do a lot of uh, fast Fourier transform, and uh, the outer product is very big for to form P. And R, the grid number of R grid is pretty big, so P is huge in memory. So um, in charm, uh, in open atom using charm plus plus, the basic computation is following. So we form this F factor, which is um, the psi. L uh, occupied and psi M, which is unoccupied. Then um, we form the P matrix by um, outer product of these two F factors and, and do for all the L M pair. 
So the memory is a primary constant for this peak calculation, uh, so it, and it's the uh, most costly step. So the typical memory that we are thinking for big system is one megabyte per state, and 10,000 total states, um, 100 gigabyte to store all the states, and one terabyte to store P, and this number of F factors. So it's important to how we parallelize um, this software. Um, so this is how we um, parallelize um, the F vectors and psi vectors. So there are R um, size of psi vectors, oh no, L plus M psi vectors that we save into the 1D char array. One char uh, has each um, psi vectors. Then we uh, form the P matrix and it is decomposed to two dimensional tiles and is saved to two dimensional char array. So this um, uh, psi vectors are um, distributed, uh, the char arrays are distributed by the runtime system. And for each node, we um, duplicate the psi vectors. So every node, node um, has all the psi, uh, all the psi occupied state psi cache, uh, psi vectors in psi cache. Then we broadcast this unoccupied states to each node to form this F vectors, uh, F vectors, so it is saved in F cache. Then we locally update each matrix style of the polarizability and repeat uh, the, these two steps until all of the unoccupied states meet this uh, side cache. So this is the parallel performance of our P calculation. Um, we benchmarked with uh, on uh, Mira uh, and this is the red is open atom result and this black is Berkeley GW, which is also a popularly used GW software. Um, the system is 108 atom, um, 2,000 ish um, states. Um, so on Mira, um, the open atom scales very well up to like 1,000 node, uh, but Berkeley GW is kind of uh, flat at this point. However, um, on Blue Water, we found that Open Atom scales a little bit differently from Mira, so we uh, have been um, discussing about what happens, and we're going to discuss actually after this uh, presentation too. So yeah, that's something that we need to know um, before moving forward. So okay, so. We, uh, we write a parallel software that scales well, um, and uh, it's good, but the, this polarizability matrix is uh, actually um, n to the fourth. And the next thing that we can do to accelerate this GW calculation is uh, uh, improve the algorithm. So there are some algorithms to improve the uh, calculation of this polarizability. Some of them are still the quarting method um, with a small prefactor, like these guys uh, has been doing. And uh, working in real space can reduce um, this scaling to QB. And these people has been published a paper. I'm not sure the software is um, open, uh, is released. But there are some um, method um, published but um, we want to use this real space polarizability representation. And from here, we want to go to the cubic scaling. So how we can do is following. So this 1 over EC minus EV can be uh, written as this integral form, which is Laplace transform. Then this polarizability matrix is um, separable in real space. So previously, the C and V index are in, uh, in the sum, but now it, it's in the separate sum, which is great. And how we can do this integral is uh, we employed a Gauss-Laguerre quadrature. So the polarizability is now um, written uh, as um, three different sums. So compared to the quarting method, our um, scaling uh, this method will give us the, the n cube scaling, and this n l is the number of quadrature node, and which it can be like a few tens. Uh, yeah, like it's pretty. It can be pretty small, so it can achieve cubic scaling. And 
to uh, save more computation with um, this real space representation on P method, we um, uh, we developed the windowed cubic Laplace method. So the number of quadrature grid depends on, we found that um, the bandwidth, uh, which is uh, the largest um, EC minus EV over E band gap. So, and the largest error occurs when um, the EC minus EV is a gap or the bandwidth. So if we divided this P calculation into um, some windows, for example, this is the example of two by two window. So we calculate this P as a sum of P1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2. Um, P2, 1 is the calculation between this, um, this um, occupied state energy window to this unoccupied state energy window. So the polarizability can be the sum of um, each window pair. And by using this, um, each, uh, each, in, in each window pair, uh, we can use pretty small number of quadrature for each window pair, which will save a lot of um, computation. So the computation cost can be estimated, so we can make the windows before the calculation actually started, starts. Uh, for example, so I come up with this um, equation to estimate the computational cost, and I compared it with the real computational cost, and it seems pretty similar, so I think, okay, I can use um, this estimated computational cost. So um, we can, uh, we can, we, we will know before the computational starts what, how many windows we are gonna use and how we can divide the windows. So this is the result of our window, the Laplace method. So this is silicon crystal with 16 atoms, and this is a, a magnesium oxide crystal with 16 atoms. Um, this blue is just Laplace method, still, uh, um, still cubing method, and this red is uh, our windowed Laplace method. As you can see, the error um, goes down pretty quickly. The x-axis here is the ratio of competition to and to the fourth method. method. So, like only less than 10% we are um, in the error range of like 0 0.01, which is pretty good um, in terms of GW calculations. Um, for magnesium oxide, this one has slightly bigger uh, band gap, so the saving is um, a little less uh, good than silicon, but still we can save um, um, the computation as well. Um, and the good thing is this system that I tested, it has only 16 atoms. So compared to the and to the Q, uh, quarting method, for a bigger system, we will um, get more savings once the system size gets bigger. So we are very excited about this windowed Laplace method. So in practice, so our method is really um, good. So where is the crossover of our cubing method? Um, so we tested our system with um, other software, which is um, into the quarting method with uh, small prefactors. So um, this is um, Yambo code, um, quarting method, GW software, and I used uh, two atom silicon crystal with AK points. Um, and this is no without acceleration, and this um, red is uh, with acceleration of Yambo code. And this is our um, windowed Laplace method. And as you can see, we get pretty similar um, error bar, um, error uh, as the Yambo code um, gives us. So even for this small, very small, like two atom system, um, we see a similar uh, savings. So and our method is cubic, so if, um, again, the system size gets bigger, then the, um, the saving would be much better. And there's another quartic term in um, self-energy calculation. So this is the equation of um, GW self-energy. And as, you, as uh, I showed you before, in polarizability, there is a one over some number here. But this is different from what, I, what we did in polarizability calculation. So the Gauss-Lagrange quadrature is not appropriate anymore. 
um, because um, for polarizability, this 1 over EC minus EV is always positive. Um, so we use this Gauss-Lagel quadrature. But for this function, uh, F, um, a, this, this number can be either positive or negative. So um, we need a better um, quadrature method. And one nice thing is uh, for small, um, small number of this, uh, it's very little contribution. So we can just set uh, it zero. Um, so we developed new quadrature method, and this is just one over x, which we want to replicate for large x. But for small x, since um, the contribution is small, we want to go, um, this function goes to zero. So this uh, x over 1 over x square is the standard method people usually use in this kind of situation. Um, so this weight function for the standard method is this. But uh, we come up with a different idea to save more um, calculations, employing this new weight function. So this fx um, uh, function is like that. So the size of the quadrature grid um, is following. The, uh, this is the percentage error um, this is, uh, that we will get. Um, and the standard method, uh, if the error goes down, then the number of quadrature grid is really big. But with a new quadrature, it can save really a lot of computation. So this is the result of um, G0, W0 gap uh, using uh, the, the windowing method that I uh, for the dynamic cell, dynamic cell, cell energy. Um, so this is again the 16 atom silicon crystal and the number of bands are 399 and the number of windows for this method is 15 and for the pole and um, 30 for uh, this state uh, part. So it's uh, a little more uh, windows for this um, self energy but uh, we can still save a lot of um, time employing um, this new quadrature and windowing method. So where we are with OpenAtom GW um, is um, here. So we wrote the serial code, and it's all complete. And we transform the serial code to parallel code with a lot of help from uh, UIUC people. And these are all complete. So we expect to release our parallel. This um, is called Cosex approximation. Um, this version, uh, we will release this version late spring. And this plasmon pole and dynamic self energy is in progress. And um, we, uh, we will implement these guys as well. Um, and we are um, beginning of uh, implementing this new cubing method to open atom. So yeah, we are very excited about this. Um, Thank you very much. Um, this is, oh, the summary. So this is the summary. Is the open atom grade uh, charm plus plus framework. And we, uh, has, we utilize this uh, R space method for polarizability. And it has many advantage. And um, charm plus plus runtime library reduces parallelization um, headaches. And it gives us good performance, very good scaling. And we developed a new cubic scaling method. And it's very straightforward, changed to sum over state method. And crossover is very small system. Thank you very much. All right, so any questions for our speaker? OK, we got one in the back right there next to you. Give me a holler. So it looks like your polarization matrix is the memory hog in the system, right? And you're talking about 90 terabytes to hold P, right? Uh, does that include doing the FFT in place? FFT in place? Yeah. Um, yes, we... That's still 90 terabytes? Yeah, we have to do this P polar... Um, FFT for this polarizability matrix, where is it? Huh? 
Yes, but uh, we do the uh, FFT for um, rows first, then um, columns later. So it's not going to be the entire P matrix. I mean, we are doing the FFT for the rows first. So the, the size of um, this uh, FFT is going to be much smaller. Does it answer? So are, sorry, are you doing a two-dimensional FFT then? I'm sorry. Are, are you doing a, a two-dimensional FFT then? If you're, yeah, if two, you're doing um, rows first. It's going to be two-dimensional FFT. But um, we first do um, the rows first. So there is an intermediate step like P, um, G, R prime kind of stuff. So. OK. Well, I, I was just thinking of if, you know, looking at something, a library like FFTW lets you do one dimensional FFTs in place. But I don't know, does anyone know if it lets you do 2D FFTs in place? To save memory footprint? I think there's a, sorry, I think there's a semantic issue. Uh, the R is a three dimensional vector. When we say we're doing a dimension, we mean we do FFTs of the column index. Yes. And R is a three dimensional grid. So P is a six dimensional object. But the way you want to do the FFT is do it along the columns and the rows. I don't know if that makes any sense. So it's not really one dimensional. Like for each fixed R prime, we FFT P of R, which is a three dimensional data set. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, go to those numbers. I think you're asking about the yeah, memory yeah. numbers. So we're not doing the one terabyte FFT. At, um, so. Um, The, so the FFT size would be the size of this F vector, not the P. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay.